October 22nd, 2023. One week until the end of the Vasa period. Pawarna day. And it's been raining today and thinking a lot about the history of Abayagiri. We went to see Terrell, you know, Bob Madlam's wife today, and uh, just remembering, recollecting Bob Madlam, who died two years ago now. Who built this building that we're sitting in. And uh, the office buildings, the mob, such a big part of Abayagiri for so long. And there's this sense of time passing, impermanence, and we did funeral chanting this evening. So people who were alive, now they're not alive. So this is just the nature of impermanence. It's just something, it's a natural truth, something that's just completely normal. Yet, if we don't recollect it, we don't contemplate it, then it's It seems like it's maybe not right. It shouldn't be that things shouldn't be this way. And also we've been working on a hand sewn G1. And this has been quite a journey over the last five days or so. And when we normally when we, this is going to kind of a training to be able to uh, re-up our hand sewing abilities for when we do the katina robe. And, but hand sewing a G1, a G1 is the most sewing out of any of our three robes. So there's the lower robe, the sabong. That's what we normally do as a katina robe because it's the smallest robe and it's the least sewing. Then there's the G1, which is our robe here that we roll and throw over our shoulder and that's actually the most sewing. Then there's the Sangati, which is the same size as the G1, but it's a double layer robe, but it's about half as much sewing as the G1. It's only one line. You don't do two lines on each seam, which we call kusi. So the G1 is the most sewing. So to hand sew a G1 is the most work out of all three robes. So it's a good training. And then to do it in such a short period of time, takes a group effort so there's been a lot of people working on it and now it's to the point where the borders are almost finished being put on and then the tags get put on and then it's finished and we we will later later on we will dye it and it'll be ready so it's been quite a journey and i i think i like in hand, hand sewing is kind of like walking on tudong and machine sewing is like driving in a car. So uh, when you hand sew, then you, you notice all of the landscape on the cloth. You notice every little thing, it's every little space, every little place where it's not quite right, and you try to straighten it out. And uh, a lot of these little inconsistencies aren't going to be noticeable when the robe is actually put on. But we notice all these little things in the, the landscape of the robe and each seam, each, each stitch is like a step, is like taking a step forward. And it can seem like we're going very, very slow and just going three, four, five steps at a time. And sometimes the thread runs out. It's like we have to take a rest. Thread runs out, we have to rethread our needle and then even just re-threading the needle can take up to 20 minutes if you don't know how to do it. And so uh, then we keep going, we keep walking, and we get sore. My hand is sore right now from hand sewing. And uh, one of the Anagarkas was saying he's the most sore he's ever been, actually, just from hand sewing. Because <laughs> we're uh, having to learn how to hold the body and you might be stooped over looking, you know, trying to learn, trying to learn the technique and haven't yet developed that muscle memory. But it's a really good traditional technique to learn. And it's the, the old way of doing the sewing. 
<clears throat> excuse me. In, uh, developing qualities like patient endurance and also how to work together. So there might be a certain way of uh, one person might want to do the seams one way, another person might want to do them another way, one person might want to do the border one way, somebody else might want to do the border another way. So the way we're doing the borders, uh, it's a technique I've been aware of, but I've never done it myself before. So at first I was thinking there was some resistance to it, but then I just thought, well, we'll just try it and see what the experience of doing the border like this is, because any time we try to do something different, we don't really know what it's going to be like until we do it. You know, I might think, oh, this is the best way to do it, but I've never actually tried that other way, so why don't I just try it out? I don't really know until I try it out. Then I saw, oh, there's some, there's some benefits to this. There's actually some benefits to doing it this way. It got me thinking that in community or just in the course of practice, there's so many opportunities to practice and to develop our practice and make progress on the path every day. I could probably think of at least 10 instances every single day where I've been able to get better at letting go and make some progress along the path. And just uh, where something where it might be like, okay, well, I wanna do it this way, but others might wanna do it another way. And then rather than push my way, then I can actually say, well, can I actually let go of this? And Sometimes I'm not able to, but more and more I am able to let go of it. And that's why I'm able to be more at ease now than in the past is because more, and, and that really comes from questioning myself and saying, can I let go of this? So I found if I never question myself, if I never say to myself, can I let go of this, then I won't be able to. But if I just question myself and test myself, <coughs> and say, can I let go of this? And then the mind will start to go through a process whereby it'll start to figure it out how oh, I can let go of this. And even sometimes telling myself I can let go of this can help me to be able to let go of things. Even just this afternoon at Santi Vihara, uh, starting to set up the room for Ajahn Amaro, what we call the garage kuti. It's actually the VIP room, but we call it the garage kuti because it used to be a garage. And uh, starting to assemble this uh, stand-up desk that can raise and lower to whatever height you prefer. And I've set one up before, and but then uh, and it takes some time to set it up. And then as I was starting to set it up, and I was starting to screw the thing together, and uh, some of the screws wouldn't go into one of the legs, and I was kind of looking and seeing what was wrong, and it turned out to be a manufacturing defect on this particular desk. And I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. And the mind started going into some negativity. And who ordered this stupid thing anyway? You know, why do we need this, this kind of stuff? And, and I started thinking, like, I hope somebody doesn't come in and ask me what I'm doing, and I'm going to have to explain it. And, and then I'm going to have to explain it to this other person. This other person is going to, and this is a big waste of time. And, and so I was just, the mind was starting to go there and then I stopped and thought, okay, well, can I let go of this? I just, uh, just kind of took stock of the situation, slowly put the thing back in the packaging. Just, okay, just don't do it right now and just reassess. And I found probably about 15 minutes went by, 15 or 20 minutes went by and I felt almost completely better, just pretty much able to drop it almost completely and was able to get into more of a positive mental state and the, that negativity passed away pretty quickly. And I, I couldn't really do that in the past, but I find, I find now when I'm, when I'm able to ask myself, can I let go of this, then, then I actually am able to. So that's, that's something we can all try to do. We can ask ourselves, can I let go of this? And uh, yesterday during the day long on compassion, talking about this idea of taking a leap of faith, 
that we're actually, we want to stop suffering. Part of us wants to stop suffering, but then our identity, how it's bound up with our suffering and our stress, and we actually, the other part of us doesn't want to let go of it because it's known because it's what's known. We don't want to go into the unknown. So so non-suffering is the unknown. We haven't really experienced that before. A new way of being, the way of non-suffering, we haven't actually experienced that before. And so that's the unknown. And so there's there can be maybe not a fear, but just a, a hesitation hesitation about stepping into the unknown, taking that leap of faith, and we w- we'd rather stay in the known, which is, but that's suffering. But at least it's what we know. At least we know what's going to happen. We're going to keep suffering. <laughs> at least we know that that's there. It's like the Google Calendar. You know, At least we know what we're doing each day. At least we can kind of fill it up with things that we know we're going to do. But if the Google Calendar is empty, then there's kind of like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do that day? So just that ability to be able to step into the unknown. And so letting go, if we, if we don't yet know how to let go, then maybe just to ask ourselves, can I, can I let go of this? Can I step into the unknown? And when we do learn how to let go, then there can be a sense of wonder, a sense of amazement. Wow, why didn't I do this before? What a relief. Why didn't I, why didn't I think to do this before? Why was I holding on to the suffering? And then it's, oh, well, that's how it works. Okay, now it's, yeah, that's, that's how it works. The clinging causes suffering and letting go, non-clinging, and, and it... Where did it go? It's it's all gone. So we start to see that uh, little by little. But in order to do that, we have to put in all this work. We have to put in the work. It's like the carpenter, the simile of the carpenter in the suttas where there's the, the Buddha talks about a carpenter who works with a hammer that has a rubber handle on it. It's a wooden handle, but it's got a rubber sheath on it. And that carpenter works each day and he makes his living and he knows each day that, you know, maybe a tiny bit of that handle has worn away, but he doesn't know how much. And he works for many years, works for a lifetime. And he knows that rubber handle is wearing away, but he doesn't know how much. But then one day it wears through, it wears through completely. And he knows it is worn through. So that's what it can be like for us. We don't know how much progress we're making along the path, but at a certain point we'll know, well, it's worn through now. And if that carpenter never picked up his hammer and did the work, then there wouldn't be a point when that handle would get worn through. But because he did that work his whole life, then there is that time when through all that work, through the use of that hammer, then the handle gets worn through, the rubber gets worn away. So with the the defilements, the kilesa, then over time, as we do the work, as we try to walk the Noble Eightfold Path, as we do the work, as we develop patience, generosity, all these qualities that we learn how to develop in the monastery, and we do that for a long time, and we're wearing them away, but we don't know how much We don't know how much. But at a certain point, we'll be able to let go of things we couldn't let go of before, and we'll know, okay, well, that bit of it has worn away. So with the hand sewing, we're training in this as well. And this is patient endurance. And sometimes when we hand sew, we'll poke ourselves with the needle. It's usually above the cuticle of the thumb that uh, you get poked. And uh, remember making a uh, making a G1 when I was in retreat in Thailand about six years ago, and uh, working on it, trying to work on it continuously, and just 
until until either I fell asleep or I would just wake up and keep working on it and I had like all these like marks on my thumb above the cuticle but learning how to learn learning how to keep going until it's finished that's uh that's another part of it and then getting help from our dhamma friends and that's another part of it so this G1, we wouldn't have been able to get it to completion in just five days. Although it has been quite a journey. We've gone a long way in five days, but we wouldn't have been able to bring it to this point of completion if we didn't work together on it. So that's the, the blessing of Sangha, the blessing of community, that we're actually able to do something like this. And we'll be able to uh, continue working on it. Any anyone who wants to continue working on it after this talk is, uh, we can we can finish it off, and we'll see. Uh, it's probably probably another couple hours of work to do on it, depending on how many of us uh, work on it together. I guess one thing to think about as well is that idea that we need to also nourish ourselves in various ways, and look after ourselves. Uh, this comes back to the reflect, something I was reflecting on the other day that uh, I've take, I took this seven month break in, in Thailand from uh, say duties here to Baigiri and then uh, did a quite a bit of traveling after I came back and then was on this uh, three-week Vasa retreat and coming off retreat and then really starting to pick things up in earnest, picking up some projects, trying to help out with various things and uh, being starting to plug fully back in to uh, my role at, at Abayagiri. And then there was, uh, and then with the robe sewing and then various other projects and kind of these self-imposed deadlines of various things, then I felt this uh, exhaustion starting to set in and I thought, oh, I, yeah, I, uh, that's familiar. I've, I knew that from before. Okay, now that's back. Now that's back. That state is back now. This kind of exhaustion, it's more like a psychic exhaustion, not really a physical exhaustion. But like, it, like if say, 20 people come to you in the morning asking for decisions about something and then this kind of psychic exhaustion starts to set in and uh and it's uh, and it's not that uh not that it's bad or overly difficult to make decisions or make calls about things but then it's like oh was that the right decision or is that going to have a good effect or what's that person going to think about that? Or, oh, if I let this person have what they want, then the other person doesn't get what they want. And if I let them get what they want, then this other person doesn't get what they want. And so, you know, oh, there's always going to be one of them who's not happy. So how do I make that decision? And then there was another uh, decision about something and it was like, okay, well, it's decided we're going to do it this way. And then uh, somebody complained about it and said, no, I think we should do it this way. And I said, ah, oh, yeah, that, that is, that's probably how we should do it. And then, but then somebody else is like, you know, I, I don't think that looks so good. I don't think we should do that that way. So it's kind of like trying to shift and adjust everything as these sort of suggestions come up. And it, uh, it reminds me of uh, a teaching of Master Hua. He, t he liked to talk about universal worthy bodhisattva, Samantabhadra, Bodhisattva, and it's this uh, particular, these different, I, the way I view these different bodhisattvas is like qualities that we can develop. And so Samantabhadra, uh, what Master Hua explains is that Samantabhadra, what he does is, is it's like he's in a big restaurant and the world is his restaurant. And so, uh, and then he's actually doling out food to everybody, but everybody's telling him, Oh, this this food's too spicy. So he's kind of like putting a little bit less spice in for them, trying to get it just right for them. And then they're like, "Well, now it's too salty." 
And so he's trying to put a little bit less salt in. And the next person is like, well, it's not salty enough. So he tries to put a little more salt in. And he's constantly trying to change the ingredients and uh, in order to satisfy as many people as possible. So he said that's, uh, that when we're like that, it, we can be very good intentioned because we want, we want to, uh, those of us who have a lot of empathy and, and who really care about the community, uh, we really want to help people to have a sense of well-being. So it's like we're always uh, trying to make things a little bit more salty or a little bit less salty or a little bit more spicy or a little bit less spicy. And uh, it's coming from a good intention. But then at a certain point, uh, we have to be able to, to give that teaching that, okay, well, it doesn't really matter how it tastes what matters is that you get nourished. So, okay, it's not gonna taste very good, but it's good for you. <laughs> so just eat it. <laughs> just uh, take these teachings. I mean, we don't wanna just, we don't, we don't wanna beat people over the head with the teachings. Like, just be mindful, you know, just let go. I always hated when people would say that. You know, just let go, what are you doing? Just let go. But uh, these things are, these types of situations are really good for honing the wisdom faculty. I remember one time at uh, us visiting Wat Pa Pong. I must have, it must have been, I can't remember exactly when. It might have been, I think I was at uh, Long Por Liam's Ngan Patipat in my 14th Vasa when I was spinning Vasa at Wapananachat and uh, spending a week at Wat Nong Pa Pong. And it's a it's a practice week, and you listen to a lot of dhamma talks and do a lot of practice together. And it happens during the vasa period. And uh, so I had this experience that really tested me, but I it it helped me to reflect on things in this in this particular way. It was uh, uh, there was another Western monk who was junior to me. Yeah, at that time, and uh, I went. I was. It was after the meal, so I went to wash my bowl, and I noticed this particular monk was washing his bowl in the spot that said, uh, "You know, lo, you know, this spot is reserved for Long Por Liam." So it's like where Long Por Liam Zupatak would take Long Por Liam's bowl to wash it, and he was washing his bowl there because it was like an. You know, it was there was a lot of space around it, and it's real comfortable. And so I saw it. I uh, saw him there, and I. I uh, said, "Oh, shouldn't you wash your bowl over there? Like that's the that's the spot that's reserved for Long Pro Liam's bowl." And then he pointed to another sign, and it said, "No talking in the bowl washing area." <laughs> <laughs> so I <laughs> was uh, I didn't really know what to do, but I was pretty upset, and uh, <laughs> so I. Uh, I actually, I think I can admit that I had some thoughts of cruelty come up, actually. <laughs> I think I wanted to punch him, but uh, uh, I didn't, fortunately. And I just, okay, can I let go of this? <laughs> so that's a, uh, those, and those types of things are gonna happen all the time. You know, that's, uh, we're gonna get tested in that way. Can I let go of this? So it's the, the very best if we could say, okay, you know, what, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that important. And uh, can I let go of this? Well, maybe I, maybe I can, maybe I can actually let go of this. So that's, that's something that we can do, which is an incredible gift to ourselves is just being able to drop things even in the face of all odds, you know, being able to drop drop things like that, because the achievement in the Dhamma is not defined by how much we do, but it's defined by how much we can let go of, how much we can drop. It's not defined by like how how many uh, how many practices we do or how much we've how much we've said or how much we've read, how much we've studied. 
that's not how achievement in the Dhamma is defined, but it's just how much can we let go of, how much can we drop, and that uh, shedding of things. And whatever we can't let go of, then, well, that's, that's the world. So achievement in the world is how much can we hold on to, how much can we gain. Yeah, but achievement in the Dhamma is the opposite. So the opposite of the world. How much can we drop? How much can we let go of? Ultimately, can we let go of this body and mind? Can we let go of everything? Till there's nothing left to let go of. That's, that's the standard that the Buddha is holding up for us. It's going to be different for everybody based on our conditioning, our kama, and how much we're willing to train ourselves, you know, how much we're willing to take a leap of faith. So it's a, but it's a great gift to ourselves if, if we're able to do that. So I think I'll leave it there for this evening. That's probably appropriate. Mm-hmm.